Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Charge Heterogeneity Analysis of Biologics by High-Resolution CIEF and High-Throughput CZE Methods, presented by Brandon Bates, Manager of Capillary Electrophoresis Field Application Support for SPIAC Separation. We're excited to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by SPIAC. SPIAC helps to improve the world we live in by enabling scientists and laboratory analysts to find answers to the complex analytical challenges they face. To learn more about SIAX, please visit SIAX.com. I am Judy O'Rourke of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. This webinar has been approved for continuing educational credits. Please click on the CE button at the bottom left corner and follow the process to receive your credits. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the green Q&A button located in the lower left of the presentation window and type your question into the box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Also, please notice that you will be viewing the presentation in the slide window. To enlarge the window, just click on the screen icon located on the lower right. And finally, if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of the presentation window or use the Q&A button to let us know that you're having a problem. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce Brandon Bates. Brandon began his CE customer support career with Beckman Coulter in 2010, transitioning to SIAX in 2014. During this six-year period, Brandon has overseen the installation and successful implementation of every SIAX CE instrument in the central U.S. through on-site support and training. He also oversees all CE application specialists in the United States. Prior to his time with SIAC separations, Brandon gained experience while employed at the University of Iowa Department of Internal Medicine, followed by a position with the Department of Microbial Systems Biology at Argonne National Laboratory. Please join me in welcoming Brandon Bates. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Thank you, Judy, and thank you to everyone around the world that's joined in on our webinar today. As she mentioned, I will be talking about charge heterogeneity in its two forms offered by SIEX, both high-resolution CIEF as well as a higher-throughput CZE option. And I will talk about each of those in more detail. But taking a step back, the typical applications that our customers utilize charge heterogeneity applications for include clone identification, stability determination, determining proteins microheterogeneity. This is most common when looking at the effect of antibody glycosylation on its charge and is therefore used for protein identification. Some other uh, <clears throat> reasons that customers would be utilizing these applications include separating uh, protein variants and just general lot consistency. So I mentioned that charge variants do occur in IgGs, proteins, whatever your sample of interest may be. Shown on this slide, I have some of the most common causes of basic and acidic variants. You can see on the left-hand column the most common basic variants listed out, as well as acidic variants on the right-hand side. Capillary isoelectric focusing is able to determine um, basic and acidic variants and give uh, rise to the ability to determine if you may or may not have any of the, uh, the listed variants shown here. As I mentioned at the beginning, we have two methods utilizing uh, capillary electrophoresis when it uh, pertains to charge heterogeneity determination. We have a capillary isoelectric focusing application and a quicker, simpler CZE free zone electrophoresis method. First, I'd like to jump in and explain in great detail um, the CIEF method as it pertains to analyzing charge variants in, in uh, IgGs, monoclonal antibodies. So before we jump into that, the definitions shown here will be important to understand as I go forward. IEF is an electrophoretic technique used to separate proteins or peptides based on their isoelectric points. CIEF, when we add the C, we're simply indicating that isoelectric focusing is done within a capillary. PI refers to the isoelectric point, and that is the pH at which the net charge on a protein or peptide is zero. It's its neutral point. 
And lastly, the ampholite is a mixture of small molecules with PI values ranging from 2.5 to 10. Shorter ampholite ranges are also available for separations that require any improved resolution. And uh, ampholites are a mixture of weak acids with a strong absorbance in the lower UV, uh, 200 to 214. As a result, our CIEF platform method utilizes UV absorbance at 280 to get around the issue of detecting the ampholytes themselves. On this slide here, I have the same amino acid, not three different amino acids, but rather the same amino acid at three different surrounding environments. In the center, you can see, in this case, this amino acid theoretical PI is 7. Therefore, when the surrounding pH of 7, the net charge is 0. In other words, it's focused to its PI of 7. If I force that amino acid into a surrounding environment of a lower pH than its PI, it then carries a net positive charge. And the opposite is true when I force that amino acid to a more basic surrounding environment. Its net charge is then negative. In other words, proteins are negatively charged, that's a net charge, at a pH higher than its PI. And proteins are positively charged at a pH below its PI. The SIAC CIEF method takes advantage of this natural process to focus your sample into a pH gradient and therefore determine its predicted PI. The kits that are used in this method include the advanced CIF starter kit, part number listed right here. That's going to include the correct neutral coated capillary that you will need for this separation, the proper CIF gel that fills the capillary, and the CIF peptide marker kit. More specifically, the peptide marker kit consists of five synthetic peptide markers with a wide range of PI values, from 4.4 all the way up to a PI of 10. Each of these vials will contain 240 microliters of the marker, which is roughly enough for 100 CIF sample injections. So in this slide here, I have uh, tried to demonstrate the first step that occurs physically on the capillary during the CIF high resolution separation method. So we obviously have in this um, image here the sample vial and the waste vial as the inlet and outlet. The anode is placed into the sample vial and cathode on the outlet waste vial. What is unique to the CIF method is that during sample injection, as opposed to loading just a small sample plug, as is with other CIF, or, um, excuse me, other CE methods, CIF will inject the sample completely filling the capillary all the way past the detection window and finally out into the waste vial. At this point, the sample mix will not be focused and it consists of your ampholyte, your PI markers, your IgG, the gel, all components of the sample mix. And again, they're filled by pressure completely from the inlet to the outlet side. That is quite unique to this method. Also unique to the CIF method is the second step of focusing. After sample loading, the ends of the capillary are immersed in an electrolyte solution. Uh, that's phosphoric acid as the analyte and sodium hydroxide as the catholyte. At this point, focusing then starts, um, and that's as soon as voltage is applied across the capillary. Um, the resulting electric field will then drive the migration of the counter ions into the capillary, in this case hydronium and hydroxyl. Um, during this process, the hydronium and hydroxyls titrate the amphalytic species towards their isoelectric points. It's a complicated way of saying during the focusing step, the applied voltage causes all proteins, PI markers, and the pH gradient to focus to their proper pH range. It's also important to understand that this process is bidirectional. In other words, when the capillary is completely filled with sample, there is a movement back and forth of the species toward their PI, which will give rise to cathodic pre-peaks. So the inset of the electropherogram I'm showing here indicates that any sample that happened in step one to have made it past the window will now be migrating toward the left. Again, a unique process to this method with bidirectional movement. As such, they'll be detected as what we call cathodic peaks.
The separation of proteins and peptides based on their PI is accomplished through the development of a pH gradient within the capillary. So to form this gradient, we use a mixture of ampholytes, um, and, and that's unlike any other separation in CE. Um, the entire capillary is going to be filled, as I mentioned in step one, with your ampholyte mix plus your sample and PI markers. And as I've already shown, the ends of the capillary are then immersed in the acid and base, and a voltage is applied across the capillary in step two, also known as focusing. In this environment, the ampholytic mixture will move within the capillary in order to form the pH gradient from acidic to basic. So to summarize those first two steps, most importantly, the second step of focusing, when voltage is applied, the ampholytes and your proteins migrate to an equilibrium. And the migration will end when the molecule has a net charge of zero, in other words, is neutral. A sign of a poor or incomplete focusing step for any of our listeners that may have already tried this method would be a split peak for a single peptide marker or known charge variant. However, on the other hand, there is a sign of excessive focusing as well, which would include protein precipitation, although this can be caused by highly concentrated samples. The current profile, much like the sample loading step, is quite unique to our CIF method. It starts between 14 to 18 microamps and then decreases rapidly, almost down to a net um, amperage of zero. Uh, it stays just above zero. And at that point, uh, we know that the focusing step has completed. It tells us there is very little movement within the capillary. And that's a good sign. It indicates that all of the proteins and peptides, as well as PI markers and pH gradient, have formed. So those are the first two steps of this method, physically on the capillary. Step one was loading the sample mix. Step two was focusing. And now, upon completion of that focusing step, the focus sample bands, bands excuse me, are stationary within the pH gradient and they need to be displaced by either a hydrodynamic force, which would just be applying pressure, or with our application through an electrophoretic force, which we're calling chemical mobilization. We use chemical mobilization because it gives a higher resolution peak, a, a flatter flow profile, basically. In chemical mobilization, the cathelite is going to be replaced with a weak acidic salt solution. We have acetic acid shown here. And this will cause the migration of the anions within the capillary, and that will disrupt the steady state that we generated by the end of focusing. Uh, these anions are going to uh, reduce the hydroxyl concentration. That causes a progressive shift in the pH throughout the entire capillary, and that's important, in the entire capillary, starting at the basic region. The migration of the sample that results across the entire capillary will give you the detection of the sample bands as they migrate past the detection window. So put simply, we're using chemical mobilization to migrate the now focused sample bands past the window in turn, and they're detected from basic to acidic peaks, or charge variants in the case of a real sample. So those are the three steps of CIF, sample loading, sample focusing, and then mobilization through uh, acetic acid chemical mobilization. I'd like now to talk about the uh, additional aspects that we had to consider when developing this method, additional uh, issues that may have arisen and what our solutions were and are now included in our SOP when you, uh, when you purchase the kit. So ideally, the pH gradient that we generate in step two is uh, in a steady state. Uh, however, even with the best caryophyllite mixture, the gradient formed will only be stable for a certain amount of time. And after a short time, uh, isotacrophoresis or a, a decay will start to take place. Uh, the direction of the pH gradient decay occurs from the center of the gradient toward the inlet and outlet vials, the analyte and catholyte vials. Over time, as this pH gradient decays, it will eventually cause an issue where the anodic and cathodic ends of the gradient tend to fall back into the analyte and catholyte vials. We obviously had to create a solution for this before we released this method. And our solution was to employ the use of stabilizers. The stabilizers at this point serve a dual purpose. They not only keep the gradient stable, but they're also the first to be consumed when the gradient starts to decay. The method that is associated for sample preparation, buffer preparation, and instrument preparation when we uh, have uh, training for this application itself will give very specific directions on how to prepare the amino diacetic acid and the cathodic stabilizer, which is 50 millimolar arginine. 
So here in this slide, you can see the stabilizers in action, more or less. And as I mentioned, in order to prevent the decay of the acidic and basic end of the pH gradient, the stabilizers are used and placed at the extreme ends of the pH gradient within the capillary and at high enough concentration that the decay will consume those molecules first. This will keep the pH gradient safe and stable during the focusing step. Here I have a more detailed image demonstrating the effect of the stabilizers at the end of the focusing step of this method. So bracket three and four indicate the range of our stabilizers. As I mentioned, they serve a dual purpose. The first purpose is to prevent, in this case, the acidic end on the left from decaying into the analyte and the basic end on the right from decaying into the catholyte. But in the case of the cathodic stabilizer, there is a second purpose, and that is to force the entire focused pH gradient to be to the left of our detector window. Otherwise, a focused basic variant can be to the right of the window, focused naturally and in reality the way it should have been. However, we would have never detected it because it would be to the right of the window upon completion of step two. So here on this slide, which looks busy, but is actually quite straightforward, I've demonstrated the effect of not having enough cathodic stabilizer. So from the top trace, working our way down to the bottom, we have increased the concentration of cathodic stabilizer. As you can see, with no cathodic stabilizer, we've lost the highly basic PI markers. Although they were loaded into the capillary, they are never going to pass the detector window and therefore not be resolved. As I work my way down this slide and I increase the example of 50 millimolar arginine that's been injected, you can see that the entire focus pH range from 10 down to 4.1 starts to be visible. And then down at 52 millimolar, we can see that we have a very tight stacking and a highly resolved region from 10 to 4.1. That's why we recommend the use and our SOP includes 50 millimolar arginine as a cathodic stabilizer. The second slide will clearly show how the amount of arginine is important for the stability of the gradient. And in addition to that, without the arginine, the gradient will decay rapidly and the markers would not fully resolve. So here on the blue trace, I may have included enough arginine to force the entire pH gradient to show up as I get down to 42, but down to 52 millimolar arginine, I have a second benefit and that is to increase the local resolution between very closely resolved isoelectric points. In the case of the red trace, you can see that the PI 8.3 and 8.2 are very well resolved when compared to the blue trace on the top. A third benefit of the pH gradient uh, being stable is that it improves the linearity when comparing detection time to marker isoelectric point. And there is a relationship between the amount of cathodic stabilizer and the amount of sample as it pertains to this linearity. In other words, the more cathodic stabilizer is added, the more compact the pH gradient becomes when focused and therefore becomes more linear. So on this slide here, I have a separation of seven synthetic peptide markers varying in size from three to six amino acids in length. And listed above each peak, I have the known PI. These PI markers do not have PTMs. They don't precipitate or aggregate and no evidence so far suggests that they're going to interact with any of your monoclonal antibodies, at least none that we've investigated to date. Because they're so small, the PI markers will migrate quickly to their PI, and this is nice because it forms a very narrow and sharp peak. I should mention that the CIF peptide marker kit contains only five of these synthetic PI markers, covering the full range of 4.1 up to PI of 10. Here I'm showing an inset using our 32 karat uh, qualitative analysis function. And what this is nice for is that it, we can enter in the known PI values on the left-hand column and the experimentally determined migration times. And the software will automatically generate and save a curve and list the goodness of fit, comparing the known PIs against their experimentally determined migration times. We can then save the method and apply this curve to your unknown peaks 
and give a very accurate prediction of the isoelectric point of those charge variants. This can be important for identity and various other means of the application. Shown here is a table that proves that these really are very short peptide sequences with a known and well-characterized PI value. If you'd like to have additional markers, apart from what we include in our five peptide marker kit, you can feel free to have that peptide sequenced, or synthesized, rather. Examples of peptide sequences and the resulting PI values are, are listed in this table, however. So I mentioned that there are the three steps included in this CIF method. Sample loading, step one. Sample uh, focusing would be step two, and then mobilization at step three. The focusing time of step two, however, is critical. Um, because that step is bidirectional and the pre-peaks can be formed, we need to ensure that enough focusing time has been included to prevent any split peaks from forming. If not adequate focusing time is imparted, we will have a split peak even with only a single PI marker, a single charge variant, whatever it may be. I'm trying to demonstrate that in this slide here, where again, we have multiple electropharograms overlaid and from the bottom to the top, I've increased the focusing time in my example. Two minutes of focusing would be much too short for this application. Our default for therapeutic antibodies as a recommended starting point is 15 minutes. So in this example, I've increased approaching that time of 15 minutes. Uh, I have room to go up to 12 there at the top. Here I've loaded only a single peptide marker, 8.3, as a known PI. So in the case of the four minute and six minute trace, when we see a split peak, it tells me right away I have not allowed enough focusing time. That indicates that during the focusing step, PI marker that made it to the right-hand side of the capillary did not have adequate time to merge with PI marker that only made it a small amount into the capillary. So although it can be tempting to decrease focusing time and other steps during the CE method to increase throughput, decreasing the time of the focusing step may end up costing you more time in the long run because you'll have to re-validate uh, rerun these samples because uh, you won't know, do I have a true uh, case of two charge variants or do I have a single charge variant that has not been focused? So I would always recommend use, utilizing at least a 15-minute focusing time for that reason. A third issue that we have tried to uh, resolve upon release of this, this kit would be uh, issues of protein concentration causing precipitation. Proteins are going to always have a low solubility at their PI within the CIF method because that method is going to concentrate the sample's uh, concentration hundreds of fold, and that can cause the precipitation that I'm talking about. When you think about it, if we force a solid stacking of a, of a protein inside of the capillary, it's obviously going to be more tempted to interact and uh, aggregate. This aggregation and precipitation will lead to lower CIF reproducibility. Now, one solution, of course, as with HPLC and in CE, is to avoid precipitation just by reducing the protein concentration you're loading. But that's a bit of a, 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 bit of a way to cheat because you're going to affect the sensitivity of your assay. It'd be a lot nicer to keep the sensitivity high and use something like I'm showing here, a mild denaturant, in our case, urea, added to our sample mix to disrupt our non-covalent bonds that's going to lead to your protein precipitation. This urea will allow for the sample mix itself to contain a higher protein concentration without the precipitation and aggregation that would occur otherwise. And that will improve and maintain sensitivity while maintaining reproducibility as well. So in keeping with my organization of introducing the topic and then demonstrating it, here I have um, my traces from top to bottom listing increasing concentrations of urea. If I don't lo load any urea on the bottom trace, you can see that I have a poorly resolved IgG uh, charge variant mixture in this case. As I increase to our recommended starting level of three molar, you can see very nicely resolved charge variants when compared to the zero molar urea example. However, I should mention if you continue and load at higher than required urea concentration, we can induce aggregation through allowing the protein to unfold in such a way that it is now interacting in a way that it had not before. So there's a happy medium here where no urea is rarely going to work. Three molar urea is typically the happy point. And then, of course, six molar urea 
although with some samples is the optimized concentration. On an IgG, it will typically just reintroduce some aggregation. Another issue that we have resolved upon release of the kit is preventing the IgG in subsequent runs from adhering to the capillary wall. It will do this naturally through ionic and hydrophobic interactions. And that absorption to the wall will cause uh, the time, the migration time, to be less reproducible from run to run. So what we do is impart a 4.3 molar urea wash between our runs. Now this 4.3 molar rinse is not to be confused with our 3 molar sample gel. This 4.3 molar rinse is utilized just to clean out the capillary between runs. And it's going to remove any adhered IgGs from the capillary wall. Shown here, I have an example overlay where you can see that the migration time shift is a little bit more than we would like to see. This is because I have not utilized in this example the 4.3 molar rinses. On this slide, I have changed not one variable with the exception of adding the 4.3 molar rinse back into our method, which of course takes time, so it is often tempting to remove it to improve throughput. However, I would always recommend to keep our 4.3 molar rinse installed in the method, and uh, you can see why when comparing this slide to this slide's results. It's a much better reproducible result. That loss of reproducibility was caused by the left current trace shown on this slide. Here I have the same electropherograms uh, current traces listed. On the left-hand side, you can see that the current is going to increase in a stepwise fashion because the adhered IgGs to the capillary wall are causing an increase in conductivity. On the right-hand current trace overlay, I have the same number of samples. However, the current trace overlay is so reproducible, you can barely even see more than one trace. And again, all I did is ensure that I don't remove the 4.3 molar rinse. There's a few other parameters to con consider for CIF, and that is, as with any CE, an increase in capillary temperature, which we control by increasing the capillary liquid coolant, will cause a higher velocity of your sample separation. That's just an important uh, concept to understand to any listeners that may be new to CE. The higher, I'm sorry, the higher capillary temperature will result in a higher velocity of your separation. Our specific method, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, utilizes UV detection at 280 nanometers. The reason is that if we detect at 214 or 220, the pH gradient uh, is formed by an amphalite mixture. That amphalite mixture itself has, absor has uh, absorbance in the 214 to 220 range, and therefore we need to utilize 280 when using this method. The sample storage temperature is kept steady us utilizing our instrument's uh, sample storage uh, uh, built-in uh, temperature control area, and the capillary temperature is kept steady at 20 degrees C. We're always going to utilize a neutral coated capillary when we're running this application, and a 200 micron aperture to any of our experienced users out there. Uh, they'll be familiar with which apertures are available. So now I can talk about a few uh, tips and tricks that are going to be important to any users listening that have already run this application, and that would be ensuring that the salt content of your final diluted sample is below 50 millimolar. This is because the salt will disturb the amphalite gradient, causing the result I'm showing here, which would be a slight decrease in resolution. If we compare the blue trace on the top to the black trace, you can see a loss of resolution, simply by not performing a buffer exchange. This overlay, again, is demonstrating the high reproducibility aspect of this application and precision. So here we have across multiple days, four days, and multiple instruments, five different instruments. We have the same IgG run with the same three PI markers with a beautiful overlay. I would expect this amount of reproducibility on, um, on a well-conditioned capillary. So the best conclusion I can give for this application would be that the report is going to highlight um, from our inter intercompany study. This was a wonderful publication because it highlighted that the charge heterogeneity analysis of antibodies by this application are robust and reliable when compared to the same method, when us using the same method, rather. And that's across all laboratories in North America and Europe. So I would expect 
following our SOP to see the same result across multiple instruments, multiple labs. Uh, this application is highly reproducible. Some additional tips and tricks before I move on to the second application. Some additional tips and tricks for the CIF method are that the amount of cathodic stabilizer itself, or arginine, can be, um, you can play around with it. If you have, know you have a basic protein that you need to determine the PI, you can include a higher arginine concentration. The acidic uh, customers out there, you can add a lower arginine concentration. You can also play around with the amount of urea in the gel. That needs to be optimized uh, between zero and six molar in my experience to determine the best urea concentration for your uh, protein or IgG of interest. The last item that you can, as an end user, uh, alter would be the actual sample proteins concentration and salt concentration. And also for anyone listening in that may have already had experience with our neutral capillary, the main issue that we want to keep an eye out for is when a neutral capillary begins to uh, approach the end of its uh, useful life, we see increased electroosmotic flow, and that's abbreviated EOF. EOF is to be avoided when we're utilizing a neutral capillary. Therefore, its presence would indicate that the neutral capillary is starting to degrade. On CIF, that becomes very clear when the pre-peaks come later run to run, all while your real mobilized peaks, that is the peaks from 15 minutes and on, are coming out further to the left or faster. Other indications that our capillary life may have been exceeded would include peak tailing and increases in our current trace from run to run despite the use of the 4.3 molar urea rinse. It's typical for our neutral capillary on this application to last roughly 50 injections. Some last tips and tricks would be, would be to always ensure that you don't have bubbles in your sample vial or buffer vials. That's the case for any CE application. Please keep the IEF gel and urea gel at 4 degrees C when not in use. However, all additional buffers, luckily, can just be kept right out on the bench next to the instrument for the convenience of, of, of their use uh, whenever you are going to run the instrument. Understanding the focusing and mobilization steps I've demonstrated are going to be critical when you're developing and troubleshooting this CIF method. And as I also demonstrated, a single method can be used to characterize a broad range of antibodies within a given pH range, in our case from 3 to 10. This is going to reduce a time-consuming design and optimization step for you. We've, we've tried to take care of that for you. The CIF separations of monoclonal antibodies can be achieved with high resolution, a reproducible method, and a robust method. So that was our first uh, CIF application, uh, which will determine PI and is very high resolution, reproducible, et cetera. We have an additional option for uh, protein identity uh, for charge heterogeneity work, and that is a free zone electrophoresis, uh, also known as CVE, analysis of charge variance application that we can use. So here on this slide, I'm demonstrating that within the capillary when running CZE for charge heterogeneity determination, we're taking advantage of EOF and its differing effect on our acidic and basic variants to force the same uh, heterogeneity profile that we achieved in the first method, we're now able to achieve in a simpler, faster, and cheaper CZE option. So on the right-hand insert, you can see an overlay of multiple electropharograms and these were achieved utilizing the CZE method. And as you can see, it's highly reproducible. I have some statistics down here in the bottom inset indicating the percent RSDs of migration time as well as corrected peak area. So here's our first example of a result that you can expect utilizing our CZE application for charge heterogeneity determination of an antibody. In this case, it's only a one mg per mil sample of our antibody. Now compare that to the first method I showed, which requires a 5 to 10 mg per mil sample concentration. Here the separation buffer was 0.05% HPMC with 380 millimolar IACA buffer and 1.9 millimolar TETA. If you have any questions about those buffer additives, I'd be happy to indicate what each of them are used for. The capillary itself is utilized uh, here as just a bare few silica capillary, again, less expensive, and uh, more forgiving than our neutral capillary. 
The separation applied voltage was uh, 30 kilovolts. So if we compare that result to the first method I was demonstrating, the CIF, which is constituted the first half of this presentation, is the uh, charge-based separation. Now, the CZE would be a uh, mobility-based uh, separation. One second here. Sorry about that. The CZE would be the mobility-based separation, the CZE which, is going the to mobility. which is going to separate based on charge and hydrodynamic size. So on this insert, let me pull up my – there we go. I finally got my annotation to work here. So uh, this top trace here is the CZE example of our uh, charge heterogeneity determination. So the first thing you'll notice is the benefit of throughput. Here in 8 to 10 minutes, I have the same result with similar resolution as I did with 20 minutes on my CIF application. So there's a, a big benefit already to the CZE method itself, and that would be uh, improved throughput. Listed here, I have directly from our software itself the runtime itself of, uh, of uh, CZE compared to CIEF. So here is the actual time program that you would program into your 32 carat for any experienced users out there, um, indicating that this is a much simpler separation than you need to uh, uh, deal with in, in the case of CIEF. So you're not limited to a 20 centimeter effective length capillary on the CZE option. If time is still not an issue for you, you can switch to a 40 centimeter effective length capillary and have an expected increase in resolution itself. So the, why the high resolution methods can be achieved using the short 20 centimeter capillary, the very fine structure of your monoclonal antibody used in this particular study can be revealed by increasing the effective length to 40. The downside, of course, is a decrease in throughput. But for you, the increase in resolution may be worth that loss of throughput. And again, the option is as simple as changing from 40 centimeter to 20 centimeter effective length bare few silica capillaries. I have the same demonstration on this slide with the exception of changing to a degraded IgG. This IgG has been exposed to a high temperature, in this case 60 degrees C, for five days. And then we perform the same two examples a 20 centimeter effective length CZE option versus a 40 centimeter effective length CZE option. And you can see some increase in resolution on the charge variance that I've just circled here, all by increasing the capillary length. Everything else has been held equal. There's an additional additive we can take advantage of, in this case TETA, to help improve the uh, the uh, overall look of this, this application result. So TETA is a surface modifier that's going to prevent our sample from sticking to the bare few silica surface. It's also going to help with resolution of a basic variant. So the basic idea here that I'm trying to demonstrate with the CZE option is that it has a platform method capability, just like our CZE full PI determining application. The CZE option is high resolution. It can be within five minutes, depending on your sample. The preparation is very easy. It's simply diluting your protein or IgG, whatever your sample may be, in water. It's much less expensive, highly reproducible, and includes method flexibility. The flexibility is afforded by selecting the correct capillary length and altering the buffer modifiers to your, uh, to your end needs. So the CIF application that I demonstrated first is going to be effective for uh, customers that require high resolution charge heterogeneity analysis, a case where you truly require PI determination. That is going to focus your sample until it's neutral, so its determination is a true PI determining application. On the other hand, the second application option I showed was the CZE option, which offers a much shorter runtime than CIF and can be used as a higher throughput method as a result. It has similar resolution, however, it cannot be used to determine 
true isoelectric point. This does not prevent it from being used as an ID application, however, since all charge variants present in CIF can also be resolved in the CZE method. So at this point, I can turn it back over to Judy to moderate any of our Q&A. And uh, I want to thank everyone again for your participation so far. And I, I look forward to seeing what questions are out there. And I'll, I'll do my best to answer. Anything I can't think of offhand, uh, we capture every question asked and every uh, contact email. So I'll be sure to, to get anything answered that I'm not, not aware of offhand. So thank you again. And I'll let you have, take control of Judy. Thank you, Brandon, for that informative presentation. It is time for Q&A. If you have a question you'd like to ask Brandon, please do so now. Just click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window, type your question into the box that appears on your screen, and click on the Send button. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Our first question is, what is the diameter of the capillary? So the internal diameter of the capillary in the case of CIF is um, 50 micron. And I believe that's the, it, it's, it's, it's 50 micron in the case of the CZE application as well. Uh, the 50 micron ID is narrow enough to give uh, uh, accurate temperature control without being so narrow that we have increased issues of, of uh, proteins precipitating. So simple answer is a 50 micron ID. Why is the 4.3 molar urea specifically chosen to rinse the capillary? Why not 5 molar? I believe it was to uh, facilitate an easier uh, buffer preparation. Uh, it's just quicker to go into solution in my experience. Uh, by all means, you can try, you can try 5 molar. Um, 4.3 was most likely used in development and found to be the, uh, the point at which there wasn't an increased benefit by having a higher concentration. That's my, my best guess on that. 4.3, at that concentration, it does a, a beautiful job without increasing it at, of uh, removing IgG from the wall. What is the typical lifetime of the capillary? <clears throat> That's a good question. So. For the CIF method itself, we're utilizing a neutral capillary. And for a well-characterized IgG that's relatively pure, we can expect roughly 50 sample injections before we're concerned about the neutral coating itself uh, wearing down to the point that EOF is coming in. So I would expect an average of 50 injections would be the, uh, the capillary life. The capillary life for the CZE method is uh, hundreds of injections because it's just a very few silica capillary. That's one of the greatest benefits that I actually didn't mention about the CZE method. It's utilizing a cheaper and longer lasting capillary. Can you recommend an alternative to urea in the CIEF method presented? Alternative, so an alternative to urea would have to be some other type of detergent so I can't think of anything offhand, but what I, can, what I do know is any ionic detergent, SDS, et cetera, cannot be used because it's going to disturb the pH gradient itself. So what I can answer is to, to, to whoever asked that question is that urea is selected because it not only pro provides a, a case where we don't have the precipitation, but it's unique as a detergent that, because it does not disturb our pH gradient. So that's the main concern when selecting an, an alternative to urea is if it's ionic, it will destroy the, uh, the pH gradient. What is the lifetime of the silica capillary? Very few silica capillary lifetime can be hundreds of injections. Um, there is no hard number that I have. Um, but it, it's it's rarely a, a concern. Typically, it's it's uh, replaced within 200 injections, um, j just for peace of mind for the end user. But it's not going to be a concern when compared to buffer life and other more important parameters for that particular application. 
but one to 200 is, is when most of my customers replace a bare fuse silica capillary. How is this different from IEX chromatography? What are the advantages and disadvantages? So I've never performed ion exchange, um, so I'm going to have to take a note of that question. So hopefully we can capture who that was from, and I'm taking a note now to, uh, to get the specific advantages and disadvantages. I know that there's an advantage to, um, to sample preparation, but I, I, I'll have to get more specific details and reach back out to that contact. Can you give a brief explanation of electroosmotic flow? I'd be happy to. So EOF is, um, is caused by the, so typically on a non-neutral coated capillary, just a bare few silica capillary, the inner wall is going to carry a charge, a negative charge. Positive ions of the buffer itself will align to this wall and create kind of a siphoning force as those positive ions are attracted to the negative outlet electrode. So the best example I can give is thinking of this as a treadmill. So EOF is analogous to the moving walkway at an airport. I travel a lot, so I think of, I think of the airport itself as this example. Anything that is migrating on its own mobility towards the negative outlet vial is going to have an observed mobility of its own inherent migration plus the force of EOF. So in that case, EOF is like the moving walkway while someone is also walking towards the gate on that treadmill. So if you were to stand on the side and watch, you would see them walking and uh, moving very quickly. Something neutral, not carrying a charge in, in CE, we can create an environment where EOF can force the resolution, and that would be analogous to someone standing still on a moving walkway. We can also utilize EOF in a case where the force of EOF has exceeded the mobility of something with the opposite charge. Even though it's repelled from the outlet electrode, we can increase EOF's force by uh, setting up the buffer pH in a proper way. And in that case, EOF is a powerful tool for resolving uh, different uh, ion concentrate or different uh, positive ion charges, I should say. So, in layman's terms, EOF is just a driving force in CE caused by the interaction of the buffer with the charged inner wall. That's the best way I could explain it over the phone. <laughs> Great. Does SIAX have a validated kit for CZE as CIEF? At this time, no. The, the, the kit for CZE is really the, um, in the form of the uh, example publications. It's going to be in the form of our um, AIBs and um, through interaction with your application specialist, uh, setting up a case where you have the proper uh, buffers prepared, uh, the proper uh, capillary installed. Uh, the best thing I can say is that at SIEX, we ensure success not just with a control, not just with a blank, but we ensure success with your true sample. So to whoever asked that, I would recommend being in touch with your application specialist and indicating, I want to try CZE, and I need to be successful with my sample of interest, and we will uh, take care of it for you at that point. Does resolution of CE depend on the length of the capillary? Yes, there's a direct correlation, uh, typically. So the longer the capillary, the higher the resolution in most instances. Uh, that was demonstrated when I showed the 20 versus 40 centimeter effective length CZE example. The downside of increasing to 40 as the effective length was it takes more time. But the benefit, and that's a big benefit, is an increased uh, resolution, especially on the charge variants on the uh, actually the acidic charge variants in this case, have an increased resolution at a longer capillary length. What were the purposes of the additives mentioned in the CZE separation? Okay, so sure, let me pull that back up. So the the EACA is a uh, aminocaproic acid 
It's an amine-based buffer. It's well known in, L in, in LC, and that's going to help with the separation of basic variants. Um, the caproic acid, is, is that, that's the main reason. It's, it's resolution of your basic variants specifically. The uh, other, let me think here, the other additive I listed which was HPMC, and that's a viscosity modifier. That's going to increase viscosity. Uh, one of the nice aspects of CE as a, as, a, as a platform is that we can control resolution. We can, we can control, in some cases, resolution, but always have direct control over velocity by increasing viscosity of what the sample is migrating through. So HPMC is, is used to increase that viscosity. And I believe I mentioned the purpose of the TETA. Um, again, that's a surface modifier. It's going to help improve the... The, uh, the resolution, the reproducibility by preventing your sample from sticking to your capillary inner wall. And it's also helping with basic variant resolution just like the EACA did. And I think that's those three modifiers are the only ones I had listed. So. Is there a limited salt concentration in your sample for CVE? That's a very good question. I'm sure there is within reason but I do not have um, an exact number that I have found. I have the exact number for CIF, and that's 50 millimolar. Um, with any separation based on ionic strength, too much salt will disturb your result, of course. Um, to play it safe, I would always perform a buffer exchange on a sample when uh, first validating the method, and then at that point, if you're handed off a sample that's in a formulation buffer with a higher salt concentration, you can uh, test it out and test the limits. We have, I have not been provided with that spec, however, so my apologies on that. But. What is the minimum protein concentration that can be used by both methods? Okay, that's another, another good, good question there. So on the CIEF method, our recommended protein concentration range is 5 mg per mil to 10 mg per mil. The reason we don't want to go below 5 mg per mil is not because you would lose your real main peaks of interest, but we're concerned that any impurities may be lost into the baseline. That's why we lowered at least 5 mg per mil. That's my limit in that case. Now the CVE limit is 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 you know we're we're using one mg per mil, so in that case I'd, I'd guess that a, a half uh, half mg per mil uh, end up would be would be uh, just fine. How do I know when the when the neutral capillary life has been exceeded? Sure. So I get this question at every install for this, this method. Um, the neutral capillary, remember, is, is used to prevent electroosmotic flow from being a, a driving force at any step of this method. If the neutral capillary begins to wear down, the neutral coating will wear down, rather, electroosmotic flow will begin, we begin to be a driving force during the focusing step. During the focusing step, you don't want any EOF. If the neutral capillary life has been exceeded, the easiest way to tell is as follows. The PI markers, uh, cathodic pre-peaks, will come out later and later rep to rep. In other words, shift to the right. At the same time, your real sample peaks will shift to the left. They'll come out sooner. So if you ever see the case where your pre-peaks and real peaks are starting to move towards one another, you know that your neutral capillary life has uh, reached an end. Um, at that point, it's time to replace the capillary. What wavelength and detector was used on the CVE method? Okay, so that I didn't even show that. So the uh, the wavelength was uh, 214, and the uh, detector it can either be a UV detector or the photodiode array detector available for the. Uh, the PA 800 plus, uh, PA 800 plus, with any any way to impart the um, the uh, 214 wavelength on there would be fine. It's important to note that the um, the neutral capillary itself cannot be subjected to the 
PDA detector. So when using the CIF method, one must always use the UV detector. But with the CZE option, it's completely up to you. You can use either the PDA or the UV detected at, uh, at uh, 214. Great. Well, I would once again like to thank Brandon Bates for his presentation. Do you have any final comments? No, not at this time. I just wanted to thank everyone again. It seemed like we had some great participation. Um, th these uh, these methods, armed with both of these methods, I, I should say, you will have full coverage and a, a platform method available to you. Um, the only question is, do I need an OPI? If you need an OPI, we have the CIF method available for you. If you just need to know protein identity, uh, charge variant determination, then we have the CZE method available to you. The last thing I'll mention is that um, at SciX, the, the application support, uh, we, we try to be the gold standard. If you have any issues with the application itself, um, please reach out to whoever it takes to get the attention of, of the app scientists in your area. In the U.S., I would be happy to take care of you. Uh, in Europe, uh, reach out accordingly through sales and our distributors. Um, again, we consider you uh, to be successful with your real sample, not just to control. So we'd be happy to, uh, to help you out from an applications perspective. And with that, just uh, thank you, everyone, once again. Thank you once again. I would also like to thank our sponsor, SciX, for making today's educational webcast possible. This webinar has been approved for continuing educational credits. Please click on the CE button at the bottom left corner and follow the process to receive your credits. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through December 29, 2016. You'll receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Goodbye. <laughs>